Atheists must think that God is important because they seem to talk about Him so much of the time. They're right, of course. God either matters a great deal or He doesn't matter at all. Science now shows God's existence is highly probable. If He really does exist, then an intelligent understanding of the original prime mover is immensely important. Who is God? Is He a person or just a blind, impersonal force? Was Jesus God? Find out today on The Carter Report. Welcome today. The topic is God. What's he like? In that classic movie, The Ten Commandments, God appears as the almighty God who was so amazing, so transcendent that he comes in a flame of fire in the burning bush. My son David gave me another movie on the Ten Commandments called uh, The Exodus. I was somewhat amazed because God in the movie The Exodus appears as a little boy. <laughs> to me, that just didn't seem to be right because in the Ten Commandments, God appears and he says, Moses, remember? <laughs> Moses, who are you? And he says, I'm the Almighty. But in the movie, The Exodus, he doesn't appear as the great God of Charlton Heston, <laughs> but he appears as a little boy. And when I thought about it, I thought, well, maybe there's a point there. The topic is, God, what's he like? The most important statement that has ever been made in the history of the affairs of men is Genesis 1 and verse 1. Look at it in the Bible. The book of Genesis, that means the book of beginnings. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Easily, but most important words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in the beginning, whenever that was, God was there. The most important statement ever made. Now, I want to start with four stories, and I'm going to share these with you. The first is about the great Professor Hubble. Now, we live in Southern California, this great place, and there's this tremendous picture that we've got here, and we put it up on the screen, and it shows the great Professor Einstein. And here, the man with the pipe is Professor Hubble. Do you know this story? It's one of the greatest of all stories. You're not going to hear this in church too often. But Einstein did not believe in the beginning. He said there's never been a beginning. The universe has always been there. The greatest mind, Einstein. But Hubble took him to the telescope and he showed him some pictures. And in the pictures you have a phenomenon that is called the red shift. Now scientists know what I'm talking about. It means that the universe is exploding out. It's moving out. The galaxies are moving apart from each other, some of them almost at the speed of light. This proves without a shadow of a doubt that the universe had a beginning. And if the universe had a beginning, listen to this, a beginning implies what? A beginner. <laughs> a beginning implies a beginner. And Einstein came to believe in God, an almighty God who was the great beginner. Story number one, story number two. Before Einstein, Einstein became very, very famous, here in the United States of America, he used to travel around from university to university and he would explain the theory of relativity that, of course, you all understand. E equals mc squared. He had a car driver. 
Now, nobody knew Professor Einstein in those days. They didn't know what he looked like. So he'd go to Harvard University. He'd give this tremendous lecture. And uh, the car driver used to sit down the back. (laughs) But he gave the lecture so many, many times uh, that the car driver memorised it. He got to know it off by heart. (laughs) One night when they got to Princeton or somewhere, Einstein wasn't feeling too good. So he said to the car driver, now look, I'm not feeling so good uh, tonight. He said, you know my lecture off by heart, don't you? He said, yeah, sure, I know it off by heart. He said, well, I'm going to sit down the back and I'll pretend to be the car driver. You go up the front and give the lecture. So he went up in front of all the scientists at Princeton or somewhere. He gave this magnificent lecture uh, by rote, just off by, by heart, about the theory of relativity. And everything was great until he got to the end. When he got to the end, another famous scientist got up and he said, "Um, I'd like to ask the great Professor Einstein a question. (laughs) Then he, he asked the car driver, he asked him this question about the theory of relativity. Einstein was sweating down the back. He thought, what on earth is he going to do? How is he going to get out of this one? And uh, the car driver's up the front and and he said, without missing a beat, oh, he said, uh, doctor, he said, your question is a very good one, but it's so very easy that anybody could answer it and I'm going to ask my car driver who was sitting down the back (laughs) if he'd come up the front and if he'd answer your question. (laughs) But Einstein, this person who once did not believe in a beginning who believed in the steady-state theory, because of what Professor Hubble showed him, came to believe in the beginning of the universe. And a beginning implies a beginner. A great friend of mine is Dr. Hugh Ross from Reasons to Believe. He's a great scientist, astrophysicist, one of the best in the world. Uh, For years he taught at uh, Caltech. Caltech, we're proud to say, is here in Southern California. And it is probably the greatest institution, the greatest university as far as physics and astronomy are concerned. Dr. Hugh Ross was on the faculty of Caltech. While he was there, he discovered quasars. I interviewed him just a few weeks ago. He's a great friend and a great scientist. He told me this. He said, they'll tell you there are no scientists who believe in God. You've got to be a fool to believe in God. He said, it's not so. He said, I was amazed when I went to the greatest university in the world, as far as physics and astronomy are concerned, that I met there some of the most devout followers of Jesus Christ. He said, scientist after scientist, because of, of science itself, had been forced to believe in the beginning. And a beginning implies a beginner. Now, most of you have heard of Dr. Richard Dawkins, uh, probably the most famous atheist in the world today. Got a great brain. He's an Englishman. He's had a number of debates with the great Dr. John Lennox of Oxford University. Dawkins and Lennox. You ought to go online and you ought to see these amazing debates. And in one of the debates, Dawkins was ridiculing the great professor, Lennox, who's a mathematician from Oxford University, because of his faith. He said, it's stupid. You have a blind faith. It's stupid. Words to that effect. Dr. Lennox said, Richard, may I ask you a question? said, yes, yes. He said, uh, do you have faith in your wife? You can see this online. Do you have faith in your wife? And almost uh, with a little indignation, he said, yes, of course, I have faith in my wife. He said, why do you have faith in your wife? He said, because of the way she looks at me and the things she does. Uh, Dr. Lennox said, he said, because of evidence. He said, yes, because of the evidence that she (laughs) showed. He said, so your faith rests upon evidence. Yes. He said, that's exactly the same as my faith. 
I have faith in God. It is not a blind faith, but I have faith in God because of the overwhelming evidence. And so, my friends, I ask you to believe today, and I ask the television audience to believe today, not because a blind faith, which I do not believe in, but I believe in an intelligent faith that is based on evidence. Listen to this. I've discovered this. The real reason many scientists reject God is because of the awful things professing Christians have done, not because of the scientific facts. Many of the great atheists in the world today have become atheists because uh, they were abused in the church by pedophiles. Now, I'm not going to mention some of them by name, but some of the most outspoken critics of God uh, were abused uh, in the church by a priest. So they're atheists, not because of science, but because uh, of the abuse of so-called Christians. I would say this today. Try to lay aside your hurts and the terrible sins of so-called Christians that we see everywhere and look at the evidence. The great text is this, the greatest statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and uh, a beginning demands a beginner. This is why many atheists for so many years have fought the discovery of the so-called Big Bang. It was called the Big Bang as a term of a derision for the act of creation because scientists did not want to believe in it. But now today we have overwhelming evidence that the universe was made, we're not talking about this earth, but the universe was made 13.78 billion years ago. People say, no, you can't believe this. That's against the, no, 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 it's not against the Bible. Goodness. We're not talking about the age of the earth. We're talking about the age of the cosmos. How old is God? Last weekend, Beverly and I went to San Francisco um, ostensibly to see our daughters, but really to see our grandchildren. <laughs> My little granddaughter, Amelie, said to me, Grandpa, yes. Grandpa, yes, come on. Grandpa, yes. Yes, Amelie. Grandpa, how old are you? She said, are you millions and millions? <laughs> uh, no, not really, Amelie. Maybe I'm starting to look millions and millions, but no, not millions and millions. But God is. The universe as we know it came into being in a flash of light and fury 13.8 billion years ago. Hey, you say, I don't believe it. Well, do some study. We know the universe is bursting out like a big giant firecracker. And we know how fast it's bursting out. It can be measured with telescopes. You can see it. No, no, you can't. No, well, maybe you haven't seen it, but others have seen it. And they've measured the speed and they can find out when it started. The universe started 13.78 or let's say 13.8 billion years ago. And God was there. He was there before Genesis 1-1. Have you ever thought of this? Oh, no, God lives up on a planet somewhere. No, no, no. He was there before, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He was there before time was created. Look at Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. Now, this is a text that is quite extraordinary. In hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie, promise, what does it say? Please look, look at it. What does it say? Tell me, come on. Before time began. People say, no, 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 there's always, been, no, no, it hasn't always been time. It is now, look at me, it is now a scientific fact that time came into being at the point of creation. Who believes this? Only Christians? No, no, no. 
Richard Dawkins believes it. All the scientists believe it. Time did not exist before the creation of the planet. This is a confirmed scientific truth. So God existed before the beginning of time. Now listen to this one. Because he existed before time, there was never a time when God did not exist. Did you get that? So it does away with the question, where did God come from? Where did God come from? No, that's, that's a silly question now. Because God is not in time. Time is in God. And time came into being 13.78 billion years ago. He was there before Genesis 1.1. So God is older than 13.8 billion years. Look at Psalm 90 and verse 2. Psalm 90 and verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So from everlasting to everlasting. No beginning and no ending. Do I understand it? No, I don't. Look at Exodus 3 and verse 14. Exodus chapter 3 in the Holy Scriptures, written, we believe, by Moses. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am. Now this term, I am, refers to this being whose name is flashing up on the television wall. This is a word that is so sacred and so holy that the Jewish rabbis will not take this name upon their lips. I could tell you stories about this. I was in Jerusalem with a rabbi who was translating the scriptures. And when he came to the name Yahweh, he got washed his hands, took a new pen. And I said, there is the name Yahweh. He blanched. He looked at me. So I were a heathen man. And you hear people continually down the street on television, people in church say, oh, my God. Do they not realize whom they are dealing with? They're not dealing with the President of the United States. They're dealing with a God of fire. The almighty God. People think he's just like us. No, he's not. The almighty God. The capital of Australia is a city by the name of Canberra. I think it's a very beautiful city. I went to the Australian War Memorial, the museum. Uh, This is the memorial, the museum. We used to live in Canberra. This is the new House of Parliament. And this is the avenue that runs down to the Houses of Parliament. It's very moving because it it tells you of all the wars that the Australians have been in. The only country that has fought with the Americans side by side for the last hundred years have been the Australians. You say, oh, the British, the French. No, 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 no. The Australians. That's why John McCain loved Australia. But if you go in there... High up over this memorial are the words. 33, Deuteronomy 33 and verse 27. Look at them in the Bible. Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. In the Australian War Memorial, the eternal God is your refuge, the eternal God. And underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy eternal God. Let me tell you folks something. When you go into battle and there's blood, you want the eternal God. There are no atheists on the front lines. When we are confronted by death and loss, the cry of the human heart is for the warm embrace of the eternal God, who is our refuge. Just recently, 
the former Governor General of Australia, the Honourable Bill Hayden, who was a confirmed outspoken atheist, came in out of the cold and confessed, all my arguments were, were weak and has become a believer in Christ. We all hunger for the embrace of the eternal God. So what is God like? Let us see if we can paint a picture today of this eternal God. Firstly, the Bible says God is a spirit, not like us. Jesus referred to his father in John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. And I would like you to turn to this text in John chapter 4 and verse 23 and 24. But the hour is coming, Jesus said, and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. What does it say? God is is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth now a spirit does not have flesh and blood and bones as you see that i have what is a spirit we have no idea really we do know that the vast mass of the universe 99 percent of the universe, this is pretty new, this material. 99% of the universe is composed of stuff that is called dark matter and dark energy. Out in the universe, you have two trillion galaxies. You can see them, but you can't see dark matter. 99.7% not of the observable universe, but of the universe that we know exists. It's composed of dark matter. You can't see it. Nobody knows what it is. We couldn't exist without it. It's a newly discovered phenomenon. And God's a bit like that. You can't see him. But everything is dependent on him. So he's not an impersonal spirit. The Bible says he is a person. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Look in the Bible. Come back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27. Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. And God said, let us, that's interesting, us, Make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So even though God doesn't have a body, as you see, that I have of flesh and bones, God is a person. He has emotions. He has feelings. He can be stirred. He combines everything that is good in everyone. Uh, Let us make man in our image, and he made men and women, you see. And we are a dim reflection of Yahweh Elohim. He is all loving. He's full of love. He's the source of love. His main characteristic is love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8 are the words. 1 John, he who does not love does not know God. If you don't love, if you don't have love in your heart, then you don't know God. For God is love. It doesn't say that love is God, but it says that God is love. And he filled the world with beauty. 
because he loves us and wants us to be happy. I'm just amazed as you go around and you see the beauty even in my own yard in Thousand Oaks and the roses and the flowers and the petals. And when you go to Yosemite, you see it all. It's very hard to be an atheist and say there is no God when you see all this. And there is more good than evil in the world. Did you hear what I said? Sometimes we see the terrible things that are happening in the world. We see the chaos of Washington. We see some bad things in the church and we say, um, where is God? But there's more good than evil in the world. But evil is a problem. If God is almighty, why does he put up with it? Now, in the next segment, I'm going to answer the question, why does a God of love permit suffering? But the Bible says, God is love. We'll be back in a moment. The word began in a village. Churches and schools sprang up and multiplied, reaching into the city. Great truths revealed to the people of Papua New Guinea, changing thousands of lives. Our eyes are going to be opened to the discovery of amazing truths. The greatest truth in the Bible, it is the truth that God loves you. It has completely changed my life and I'm going to be baptized this Sabbath. Pastor Kata has put something in my heart that I will never forget. Thank you, Pastor Kata, for your program. It has changed my life completely. John Carter's Great Truths Revealed was recorded live from Papua New Guinea. Experience the miracles in this 21 DVD series for a gift of $150 US or $210 Australian. To order, visit our website or call. 1.3 billion people live in India. Two hundred million of these are Dalits. Dalits, formerly called untouchables, are the lowest members of the caste system. One hundred percent of your gift will go to fund projects for Dalit girls as an alternative to slavery and prostitution. Your gift of $600 will educate, clothe, and feed one Dalit girl between 5 and 15 years of age for one year. Go to carterreport.org or to the address on the screen to send your gift of $600 and change the life of one Indian Dalit girl for one full year. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.